Thanks for downloading this episode of the Resilient Advisor Show. This episode is part of the Investment Spotlight series with my partner, Chris Versace. Chris, today we, we spoke with another company that fits into this cleaner living theme, which really our last couple of shows have fallen into the scene. What are your thoughts on Optimi Health? Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Jay. They're attacking um, two or three different markets with natural products, which you know, right at the heart of our cleaner living investment theme, no question about it. But what I like about it are the growth prospects uh, for the solutions that they're bringing, which are, you know, found, have a foundation in mushrooms with applications, not only in functional products, but also in psychedelic products. And I, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this company develops. But one of the, one of the things I really, really liked about it is they are taking a long-term approach. And I, what, what I mean by that is they're being methodical, they're focused on product quality, they're gonna be uh, you know, selling product into, for others to build into final product, but they'll also have their own final products. And I, I think as we sit here today, I, I don't think that I've, I've heard a company story that's quite as differentiated as this. And in, as you can tell, I'm getting excited because of the potential growth prospects where some put the mushroom nutraceutical market by 2025 at $18 billion. So it, it's going to be an interesting one to watch. It's definitely an interesting story. I really enjoyed the conversations around what they're doing with protein powder. So make mm -hmm. sure you stick mm -hmm. around in the interview and listen for that. I hope you enjoyed this interview with JJ Wilson and Bill Siprick of Optimi Health. Jay Coulter and Chris Versace do not own any interest in the companies that they interview at the time of the recording or 30 days after the initial release of the show. On this episode of the Investment Spotlight series, Chris Versace and I are speaking with members of the leadership team at Optima Health. JJ Wilson serves as chairman of the board and Bill Siprick serves as CEO. Gentlemen, Chris will be driving most of the questions in this interview as a former Wall Street analyst He's going to help viewers get a deep dive into your company. But since a portion of our viewers are financial advisors and portfolio managers, I'd like to start with this question. And Bill, I'd like to pose it to you. Why should portfolio managers keep an eye on Optimi? Uh, I think there's a couple of reasons why they should keep an eye on us. Uh, we are a health and wellness company, uh, but I think what sets us apart, especially in the ever-evolving uh, functional and psychedelic mushroom space, it's commitment to quality and something that Optimi believes in and that you're going to see and th through our actions is the commitment to quality, everything starting from the research uh, to what we're going to put into uh, amazing products that we get into the hands of individuals and health professionals. That's what's ultimately going to make the difference. So it's really a quality play is, is what you're saying, right? There's a lot, it's, it's almost like the uh, cannabis space. There's, there's some good products, some excellent products, and you want to be in kind of the, the, it sounds like the premium category. We're going to set the standard. There's other players out there. And as you said, Chris, in the cannabis space, we certainly saw those that uh, were quick to market and we've got a longer term lens and perspective on it. And our commitment, even through our production facility, is going to we're going to be GMP certified out the gate. And what's important about that is the the commitment and the guarantee of quality that we're going to provide. I think others are going to have a real hard time to keep up with. Okay, let's let, let's take a step back because you know there there's the functional health market, and, and you mentioned the the psychedelic market. But, and there are various solutions. Some are more natural in nature. Some are synthesized in nature. Your solutions for the entire company seem to zero in on mushrooms. And I know there's a lot of joke about magic mushrooms and that sort of thing, but what are the properties tucked inside these, these mushrooms that speak to either functional health and or the psychedelic markets? JJ, you want to start on that one? Yeah, sure. Happy to do it. Um, so there's really two fold. There's, there's the medicinal or functional side, and then there's the, what we call the psilocybin side and psilocybin gets looped into the category or the, the, the sort of umbrella um, section that is known as psychedelics and uh, psilocybin independently outside of having psychoactive effects is actually a very powerful product on its own. And through our first um, clinical trials and dosing study, we're actually going to explore what that looks like looking at different measurements and dosing amounts 
um, with various psychoactive experiences throughout. So once you sort of surpass an eight to 10 um, uh, milligram a, a dosing amount, uh, you do start to experience those psychoactive experiences. But for us, it's really just understanding not only the psychoactive piece, but also what are some of the core properties within psilocybin itself that actually are going to add value where you're not going to have any sort of hallucinogenic, or as you might have said, the magic mushroom experience. Right. right. Are, are, are uh, there just, just let me ask on that particular aspect of it, are there any targeted applications you know we, we we've read and spoken about other companies where oh we, we think you know ptsd depression the, the, those sort of you know, end market afflictions if mm -hmm. you will mm -hmm. our large uh, approach is under the category of depression from there depression sort of has a lot of let's call it tentacles and those tentacles mm -hmm or outcomes of depression are things like anxiety, are things like alcoholism, are things like addiction. So by starting first with depression and really diving into how the natural product can actually help those suffering with, let's call it largely the depression side uh, of a human condition, and then perhaps exploring what the fallouts of or the tentacles of that are. Got it. And, and we know that there are some other companies out there you guys alluded to that are you know, doing various things. Some, some are wanting to be um, a product solution. Others see a, a larger umbrella offering of a service solution that might include, you know, working with clinician, uh, clinicians, excuse me, clinics and others. How do you guys fall in? What, what, what's the, the focus for you? Yeah, first and foremost, I think, uh, as Bill noted a little earlier, our primary focus is quality and consistency of the material product itself. So where we really see positioning ourselves as being a, a, a competitive player in the space is really ensuring that we're providing product, raw material um, that's GMP certified, that's of the highest quality and that's consistent. And I think timing of that's been pretty important. I think if we had started this project any earlier, the market wouldn't have been ready. Um, and you're seeing specifically within Canada, a lot of lobbying for the legalization of, uh, of, of use for psilocybin in terminally ill patients. Um, and, and the growing interest in, in the space for the use of the product is definitely increasing. So I think timing has been very important. Um, and then, of course, you're seeing certain states across the U.S. legalize it in sort of a, a more recreational format, which we find very interesting. Um, what I like about how we've consistently thought about our end use product is that it can really go both ways. We're definitely exploring what the pharmaceutical side looks like. Um, you know, completing and, and, and delivering on our own clinical trials, using a natural product, developing formulations within the natural product. But that product itself, being that it is natural, is going to have a likely, uh, an easier time um, providing or supplying to, let's call it some sort of recreational market, should that inevitably come to fruition, which I think we all know is, 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 is a number of years away if that is to come to fruition. But I like the idea of hedging the business in a way that allows us to be able to offer that um, no matter which way it goes. So you, you and, and Chris, like you sorry, I could yeah. position us because I get asked this, uh, given that I'm, I'm new to Optimize. I get, I position us as a products company, which also includes the research and development, uh, and products, meaning we're the ones actually developing them, uh, from the formulation stage to, uh, what we do and towards the end user. What I, I don't at this point see that and, and as you noted, some of the organizations and companies are getting deep into the clinical and the experience. We're truly going to be more focused on the R&D and the products. So do you, I mean, I looked at your presentation, uh, as I joked with you guys before we, we started recording, uh, it's page 10 and there, there's, you know, some nutraceutical products. Do you plan on having your own branded products or your own sub-branded products out in the marketplace? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so so the the point the reason I asked that is, JJ, when you were chat when you were giving your answer, it almost sounded like you were going to be, um, as I like to say, an arms merchant, right? Selling to various other companies, um, which is a great, from my perspective, an investment strategy, uh, which I've dubbed uh, "buy the bullets, not the guns," right? You want to buy the people who are supplying everybody, so a rising tide lifts. So, mm -hmm. are, are is so my my actual question is. Are you planning on doing some of that as well as bringing your own products to market? And, and if so, how do you balance those two long-term? Sure. Uh, I mean, the difference between, I think, cannabis or, or psilocybin or even just medicinal functional mushrooms 
is the ability that you can grow in these facilities. So right now we're constructing two 10,000 square foot facilities that will be GMP certified. Um, and the vertical application of growth is pretty amazing. And the number of yields and crops and the amount of capacity that these facilities can host um, is pretty amazing. Um, so I think positioning the production or the farm's business to be able to do both and that it can be a supplier to our own nutraceutical um, line of products, as well as be a supplier um, to third party partners, co-packers, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Something that we're definitely exploring um, as we develop the commercialization strategy for the production facilities. Okay. And then and the demand we're seeing is really interesting, even on the functional side in Canada, Europe, North and United States, the demand even for functional mushrooms that people are using in cuisine is something I wasn't even aware of until I was at a local Whole Foods and I saw a mix of some of the most common functional mushrooms. And that's the first time I would tell you with certainty two years ago, that didn't exist. And I think as people become aware of our facilities up and running and what we expect to be uh, fairly amazing yield rates that we're gonna get a lot of demands and it will give us that flexibility, as JJ said, that we're going to have the opportunity to supply our own products. And we know already, based on uh, demand, that we're going to have people knocking on our door asking for our products. And that's on the psilocybin and functional space. So that, that, that's an interesting setup for my next question, which um, I think in your same presentation, you guys said that, and I, I don't know the third party data that you're using, but by 2025, Mushrooms are a $34 billion market with about 18 billion out of nutraceuticals. So what's, what, as you guys see it sitting in the industry, knowing what's going on, what are the catalysts to take the, that subsector to 18 billion? Is it just more people bringing more products out, more, um, more approvals for the, the, the psychedelic aspects of it, or is it more the functional that's really driving it? Help, help us really wrap our heads and brains around this, this growth vector that you see. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll go first, Bill. Um, sure. I think largely the uh, continued growth of health and wellness at large continues to be a hugely driving factor. I think specifically with COVID and how people are thinking about their immune systems and how they're considering what their supplement and vitamin regime and intake is, is increasing, um, not only just within functional and medicinal mushrooms and set themselves, but, you know, when you look at the market data and the expectation for supplements, you know, the, the, the overall consumption just continues to increase. Right. Um, so I think that on the functional medicinal side is probably the largest driver. Um, and I think awareness, uh, I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, opportunity for education in what functional medicinal mushrooms can do to um to support individuals humans etc and not even if you're suffering from lack of sleep but almost from a good to great model um where it's going to help you get an even better sleep or if you have an incredible immune system what are you doing to maintain that um, and we're seeing that more and more. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity to continue on the education side of, of just how powerful uh, fungi can be. And we've been in it now for, you know, researching for two and a half, three years. We actually initiated the business about a year and a half ago. Um, and just on my own uh, understanding of, of the space and what I'm reading, I consistently see and hear more and more and more and more and more, which is, which is great and fantastic. And I'm sure you are too. Yes. And, and then on the psilocybin side, um, it's the same thing, you know, uh, Newsweek, I think every day I'm opening up uh, the newspaper and I am, reading, mail. I am reading something related to not only psychedelics, but almost specific to psilocybin um, and what's going on in the world in terms of research, what's going on in terms mm -hmm. of world benefits, Treat treatment plans, so on and so forth. So I think from a business perspective, um, those are the things that we're looking at to make sure that as we consider how to grow, what we're going to grow, the products we're going to release on the nutraceutical side is just being very in tune with what's going on and making sure that, um, you know, we're ahead of the game specifically within IP formulation development, things of that nature. And the IP and the formulation development doesn't just sit within the psilocybin side, you know, there's so much opportunity that we're exploring now within the nutri within the nutraceutical side. Um, medicinal and functional, 
um, where you can look at synergistic effects, entourage effects, so on and so forth. Very little has actually been done in that space. Um, and we're, we're exploring that as well. So, so Bill, Chris, so I can you, add Jake, to that. If, yeah, if let, let, let me just get, let me just get one, yeah, one, one, one quick point in. Um, so I, I guess what I want to, what I'm trying to wrap my head around is sure. mushrooms have been around for a long time. Like I remember as a kid complaining to my parents, uh, you know, that looks like a filter. I'm not eating that. Forget <laughs> it to, you know, growing up and, and eating, a, you know, I mean, I probably have several cartons of mushrooms in my refrigerator right now. But what, what is it from the application side that has changed about the way um, mushrooms are viewed as a, as a solution? It, what, and what, I guess what I'm asking is in the last few years, has, has, has the attitude, why has the attitude changed about mushrooms? I, I can start and then JJ add in. Sure. Uh, one part you need to understand, Chris, to the comment you made, in Eastern cultures, so in, in China, Japan, uh, a lot of uh, Asia Pacific countries, mushrooms, functional and uh, psychedelic, in some form or fashion, have been around and used in some form or fashion for thousands of years. And in a North American basis, First Nations are well aware of, and in particular where we are in Vancouver, BC, or in uh, Western United States, it's not a new thing. The difference is, as JJ said, the awareness level the acceptance. So to the cultures that grew up understanding and having mushrooms somewhere in the mix, whether it was from a functional side or, or for, from a nutrition, we're just catching up and the activation is happening through the awareness that's happening. There's a lot more that needs to be done. I think to see that really excessive growth uh, that I believe in, it, it's, it's a continuation of that awareness and the psilocybin it's dusting off. I mean, as, as you're well aware, the controlled substance act 74 kind of put the kibosh on really good research that was being done right. in many different areas with psychedelics. And there's a medical community, almost a generation got skipped and a new one that's very curious and looking for alternatives. And, and to be very specific, as JJ mentioned about applications in let's just say anxiety or depression, where the lead meds are SSRIs, for those who've taken them, the side effect profiles are horrific. So the opportunity for microdosing and having a break for a period of time and to experience a level of uh, improvement, just in terms of your perception of the world, uh, your health and well-being, that's breakthrough. And, and that we're just on the cutting edge of it. So that's yeah, the, that, and that's where that our actually is. That actually dovetails really well with one of our investment themes, which is cleaner living, where people are looking for more natural, organic, non-GMO, um, and, and again, natural solutions. So this that really fits in extremely well with, with that, um, not just on the functional side, but also really on the health side or cleaner body side. Agreed. Now, I'm, so, I'm sorry, JJ, I cut you off. You, you were about to say something about um, the functional aspect. Uh, you know, and I can't remember, but I, I, and I don't really have anything to go off on, you know, more than what Bill said, other than, okay. I think, you know, when you're, you're looking at what you're putting in your body, the incentive to choose the natural option, uh, first, depending on cost, which I think is ultimately going to be the deciding factor, um, is that you will choose the natural one first. I totally agree. Totally agree. What now you guys are vertically integrated and you're, you're deciding that you're gonna have your own products. Um, in terms of like distribution, other things, uh, entering the US, Europe, other markets, what's, what's the long-term framework in terms of revenue opportunities for you guys? What, what, whether this is for functional actually or for uh, the other aspect of the business? I think functional first, uh, we're gonna be launching uh, sometime within the end of the year on the nutraceutical side. I think one thing that as a business we're committed to is uh, slow and steady wins the race. We want to do things right. Um, we want to make sure that we're, we're learning from maybe smaller markets first, like up here in Canada, um, notwithstanding the, the sense of urgency that I think is required, but I think making sure that we're doing it right first and understanding, um, you know, is, is the product assortment that we're launching with accurate? Do we need to introduce something new prior to going into the U.S.? 
Um, you know, we've been pretty strategic around making sure that we have a clear path to differentiation in some of our products, specifically the limitless protein um, and the limitless capsules, which is um, a fairly unique offering. Um, so we're could, deploying- could you, expand, could you expand on that? What, what makes them limitless? Sure. I mean, limitless is just the, the, the name essentially, but what we looked at doing is oftentimes you'll see uh, specific strain varieties exclusive to one capsule. So lion's mane, chaga, rishi, et cetera. Um, what we wanted to look at doing is, is providing some sort of hybrid capsule where you're actually getting a little bit of all of them. Um, it's not necessarily going to impact you in the same way that perhaps just a turkey tail would because there's a much less amount in it. Um, but it's sort of like a status quo um, amount that's actually just going to collectively come together to to support things like immunity um, as sort of a multivitamin, if you want to think about it in that way. And then we looked at just the general consumption of protein powder um, in health and wellness and knowing that that's a huge category, we wanted to play in it. And there really is no uh, functional mushroom vegan protein powder um, that really fit our needs or what we felt was, was viable on the market. So we're introducing that as well with that same limitless combination of five different strains within a vegan protein powder itself. Well, I'll say one thing. If you're looking for someone to test and sample <laughs> here, and I, I say that because there, honestly, uh, there's a lot of crap out there. There in, is. In, in, in terms of protein powders. I, and Lord, Lord knows I've, I've tried various ones and, you know, it, I'm pretty picky, Chris, and, and I just had my first sample this past weekend, and I'm pleased to say that it passed for me the important part, the taste and texture. Taste. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. And as I asked my team, I said, well, the results, hey, do I look like I have more aura today or <laughs> something changed? I mean, and, and nobody, every, it went surprisingly quiet, so I'm not sure yeah, how to read that, yeah, but oh boy, it yeah. tasted good. Maybe, maybe you're not that angelic, Bill. <laughs> not yet. I think one other important part just to consider on the nutraceutical side within the actual materials itself, uh, specific to our products is that we're emphasizing fruiting body. So largely speaking, when we think about product quality, a lot of our competitors are, or let's call it a mushroom functional mushroom providers that are out there in the nutraceutical market. Um, the majority of that mushroom product or biomass is based on mycelium, which is a less potent, less powerful less expensive um, format, whereas we're emphasizing fruiting body. And the, the easiest way I can explain it is what you see is the actual mushroom. Typically, when you go into a grocery store is the fruiting body. The roots that grow underneath the ground are, are what's considered mycelium. Um, so just important to note that we're, we're, as I think Bill's mentioned a couple of times, really emphasizing the highest quality possible. And that's not just in what we're growing on our production farms, but also considering what we're putting into our nutraceutical products that are going to be hitting a shelves by the end of the year. Right. Now, again, just to pick up on that, um, new pro products by the end of the year, but I believe you guys were expected to have some news on the psilocybin front during the second quarter, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what was that? So what we're in, or what quarter are we in right now? <laughs> Q3. You drink yeah. finishing off, wrapping it up. Yeah. Um, so we uh, have we are in partnership with the University of Calgary on the philosophy mm -hmm. and research front. Um, they're a great institution to be working with. More specifically, we're working with a clinical trial accelerator group based within the University of Calgary called Impact. Mm -hmm. um, and Impact is essentially supporting us throughout the deployment and execution of our clinical trial. Um, which is going to be, uh, which was originally planned to be slotted for Q2. We've now pushed it to Q4. Okay. Um, and really the challenges there for us have been really making sure that we have the accurate data. And because it's new and it's a natural product, we really want to make sure that again, going back to doing it right, slow and steady wins the race. Um, so there's that to consider. And there's also Health Canada, right, which is similar to what uh, exists down in the U.S. Uh, within the FDA and really making sure that um, you're compliant with what they're doing, because if you're not or with what their expectations are, if you go and submit a protocol for a clinical trial and you're missing X, Y and Z, you're delayed, you know, five, six, seven, eight months, even up to a year. So I would rather wait, make sure that we submit the protocol right with the accurate data. Um, so that's pushed us a little bit. Um, which I'm okay with because I'd rather prioritize doing it properly. 
I totally agree. Now, I, I think in reviewing your presentation and some other materials, there's some consulting revenue as well that you guys are picking up. Is that right? Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit for me? Yeah, I'm trying to read my notes. Um, I just saw that maybe it's the relationship that you just alluded to. Maybe I, I think what happened was I, I kind of read into it that maybe you guys are consulting with the university and therefore there might be some revenue tied to that. No, no, it's really more they're a research partner. Yeah. Okay. okay. We we see down the road. I mean, Chris, so as we build out facility one, and I just want to expand on JJ's comments. So on our first facility that yeah. we we expect to be uh, having it functional before the end of the calendar year and having our first harvest in Q1, Q2. And, and then from there, to be honest, the sky's the limit because we think the demand is going to push us. And facility two, by the way, is only maybe six to eight weeks behind in terms of uh, being to the exact level of when we feel that we'd be ready. So for that one, uh, by the start of the calendar year, we'd be ready to start having it be operational. We're gonna determine what we're gonna grow uh, based on the demand. I mean, we know, and we've got good supply for our, our existing products today. Uh, th I think that it's gonna be an interesting mix to see, uh, as I say, based on the inquiries we have today of what first harvest is going to look like. We fortunately have the opportunity to have several at a given time, uh, but importantly, the facilities are going to pass the standards uh, to be GMP certified, but then also to be able to produce psilocybin producing. And of course, there's what, 23 strains of mushrooms that we can uh, extract from. We're just gonna determine the ones that make the most sense. And right. again, with the goal being purity. What's, and the lab facilities on site will help us really with that. What's the length of time to grow and then harvest? It's about six weeks. Okay. You know, so you're from, from germination to, to harvest is somewhere between on the long side eight uh, and, and certainly through startup, we're uh, as I'll, we'll keep saying slow and steady. We're going to take our time through the first, but once, uh, once we're truly used to the system, we should be on about a six week. And then if you factor in sort of cut over cleanup facility, uh, you can do the math in terms of the number of turns that you could do through the facility. Oh, I am, the I am right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we're taking a conservative approach because again, we want to do it right. We we've learned through uh, some partners of ours uh, with their experience through cannabis that have done an amazing job uh, and, and are really setting the standard that uh, that was the approach they took. And it's absolutely setting them apart in the marketplace right now. And we intend to do the same and we're going to create the space because quite frankly, nobody's doing it. And that's the part that has, I think, so many intrigue, great right from the health authorities mm -hmm. uh, through to many groups that are interested in being able to have access to supply. So uh, let me ask you this question. It just, you, you mentioned the, the, the capacity of the different products. Fast forward to three years from now, right? How do you see the business? What's, what's the rough split between functional and psychedelic? Um, how much of is your own product? How much is third party product that you're supplying? Going back to my comment about, you know, uh, being an arms merchant, what, what do you think it will look like? Um, love this question. Uh, and what I love about it is I think the flexibility of where the business can go. And I think that if in three years we see so much demand for psilocybin and that that's where the maximum sort of. I think revenue we can get from growing just purely psilocybin in both facilities, um, then that's what we'll do. Um, the benefit of Princeton and where our facilities are located is we have the ability to develop um, at this stage four more 10,000 square foot facilities. So the demand's there for us to, to, to quickly react um, and do so. Um, so I think, I think to, to summarize, Ultimately, we're going to go with where the market demand is and where it makes the most sense for the business um, without compromising on quality, um, I think is the best way that I can say it. And let Elle, me just you want to add on that. Yeah, I would just add to say the other part, too, is we look at different markets. We we're really we're quietly confident of the blueprint we have to put these facilities in place. And as we learn as we get up and operational through facility one and facility two, as JG said, the opportunity 
fortunately there's land princeton if if and not princeton new jersey but princeton <laughs> british columbia uh land's a little cheaper than princeton new jersey lots of room to expand it hasn't been lost upon us though in jurisdictions that are friendly in the us such as oregon and mm -hmm. and colorado can we duplicate that blueprint and and we're pretty confident i mean we're there's a lot of proprietary things that we're doing that we think are going to really, again, set us apart to drive that high quality. Could we replicate that in another geography? I mean, we're quietly confident we absolutely could. And okay. it's something that as we look to the future, I'd love to be having that interview in three years saying, yes, we're now in the process of breaking ground and or having facilities in different jurisdictions operational. So just two, two quick follow on questions. One to JJ with your comments. Um, following the market where it goes, uh, from your perspective, does it really matter if it's nutraceutical or um, uh, psychedelic in, in the sense of are the margins roughly the same? No, I do not believe the, mar I do not believe the margins will be the same at all. Okay. Um, I think depending on demand, you're going to see um, you're going to see the margin for psilocybin likely be the, the winner, depending on what occurs. Um, I think right now the price, as Bill alluded to slightly earlier, for medicinal and functional is quite competitive, and you can you can definitely be a winner in the space because the demand is already there. Um, in three years' time, we'll see what the supply is like and how that changes things. I think if we watch any sort of agricultural product in its early stage evolution, you know, as more players come up, you know, you want to make sure that you're you're growing strains that actually have the demand and that you can yield the most margin from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, Bill, you know, if you're thinking about the U.S. potentially with some, uh, let's say, onshore, sounds funny to say from Canada, but onshore um, manufacturing facilities, does that make the company's entrance into the U.S. a little easier? I think it does, because as you know from the cannabis space, that the border can be an issue. Even if you've got a jurisdiction that's friendly, right down to, and I find it unique, that it can be uh, a metropolitan area that can actually say that this passes regulations. The minute you're crossing that border, federal jurisdiction still, even with marijuana or cannabis, it's a controlled substance and it can get complicated. And I'm a guy that likes easy. And I think again, uh, as I'm getting immersed in uh, with the organization, we want to find the path that's going to make sense and also give us, again, competitive advantage in the United States and or other markets we go into. And I think that that might be an interesting way. If there was a way that we could uh, utilize our facilities and expand because it's easier, we know everything right down to the trades that come in and put the heating and ventilation and AC or refrigeration units in, there's something to be said about control. At the same time, you get a partner, somebody in location, and I've done this in other businesses through my career. Uh, you can make it work. You just need to find some a, a group in a jurisdiction you trust, and that's really open to the idea. And you know, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Princeton, BC. They've been incredibly accommodating, and they want us there. Where it's not uh, hyperbole to say we're going to be the one of the largest employers there within a, a matter of years, and that on its own is quite exciting. Just following on that, um, are you guys seeing any difficulty in attracting uh, labor? And it, it depends on, uh, ask me that in six months when we're operational. I, okay. think, the, I, I think the answer is going to be no. And I say that because Princeton's actually a pretty nice spot. And there's a lot of areas, including the interior of British Columbia, which can be extremely expensive. And there's a lot of attractive qualities in this case to that jurisdiction. And that on its own for people that uh, have young families, uh, it's a very safe community. So we think that it, the, there would be an appeal. It's also not that difficult to get to. And we think that the opportunity for people to commute, and, and there's several on our team that that's what they're doing. Uh, driving up, well, some of our crazy people drive up for the day and back, which that might be a bit aggressive for me. Uh, <laughs> but certainly you can make a, a pretty easy couple days there have an impact. And then you always need that on site. And fortunately, right now, we've, we've lucked into a group of uh, 
highly professional, highly committed locals that are just thrilled to be part of the operation. Excellent. And, and la- last question for you, Bill, and then I'll have one for JJ. So Bill, several times you've said you're relatively new to the company. What was it that, you know, when the opportunity arose and you did your homework and you got very, you know, obviously you got excited and committed. What was it? Was it the long-term prospects, uh, you know, a particular entree into one market? What was it that really got you excited? I checked several boxes for me. I, I started my career with Procter & Gamble a long time ago. And it was in the health and healthcare space and specifically the prescription side and, and over the counter. And I loved it. 15, first 15 years of my working career, I said to JJ and the others uh, and my team, I didn't feel like I ever worked a day. So health and wellness, and I'm somebody who even in his uh, mid fifties, I'm active, I'm fit. Uh, I, I am every new supplement that's ever hit the market. I've probably tried it. And then some, when I looked at the value proposition of Optimi and what the intent was, uh, mushrooms was not something that other than studying it in microbiology and the fungi as a class, right? way too long ago. I was intrigued as I got to see the whole idea of we were going to have this value proposition of cultivation to consumer. That got me pretty excited. As a guy who came from a products company, you weren't you'd be hard pressed to say that everything that came out and it's not in pharmaceuticals was not, not natural, uh, but the, the wellness factor in improving human performance or uh, addressing disease conditions, highly appealing in this space. It's the opportunity, as JJ said, I, it didn't take me long to research the field. And it's like, okay, this space is exploding. And I saw an angle that we're taking and I thought, but nobody's doing it well. As we saw in cannabis, as you see in a lot of spaces that emerge, they become hot. You get people who bit entrance in. They want (laughs) to make a buck and get out. What attracted me, my first conversation with JJ and the team, it was all about this is a long play. And we're here committed. We've got a path to quality. And it just checked so many boxes like, great, how, how do we find a path to work together? Okay. Cool. And then um, JJ, la- last question. Uh, for someone who's on the fence about um, nutraceuticals and, and mushroom formulated products that are out there, whether mm-hmm. it's one of the company's forthcoming products or one that's in the marketplace today, name one, name two that will kind of make them converts from a taste performance perspective. I mean, I think definitely the limitless protein for sure. I think at the end of the day, everyone's taking a form of protein supplement in, in, in some way, shape or form, whether they know it or not, you know, you might be buying some sort of, um, you know, modified X, Y, and Z, and it's a tempeh or it's a tofu or a certain extent, you know, you're, 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 you're taking in protein. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that being able to, uh, understand the benefits with the flavors and the added value of the protein is probably going to be one of the best ways to sort of get yourself comfortable with, with what it means to integrate functional or medicinal mushrooms into your diet. Great. Uh, for my own personal knowledge, uh, vanilla, vanilla, that's right. First will be vanilla, but we have, we have other flavors coming out. Excellent. 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 Uh, Jay, anything else? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts here as we wrap up. You know, first, the reason that this investment spotlight show has been so successful is because of the deep research Chris does before the interview. Chris, you did a great job helping the team tell their story and go deep. Number two, I know it's been brought up three times. I can't wait to try that protein powder. And in fact, a follow up to this interview, maybe I'll take a video of trying it and some of the results that we see. And maybe I could get my partner, Chris, to do some of that as well. Oh, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah. That'd be great. Well, and lastly, uh, w- lastly, one of the themes that we're really seeing in the marketplace for thematic investors is this cleaner living theme. Yeah. And Chris's research company has been on board with this for a long time. This clearly fits squarely in that theme. And I look forward to watching you guys grow. For viewers and podcast listeners, if you'd like to learn more about Optimi Health, please visit OptimiHealth.ca. That's OptimiHealth.ca. 
And to watch past episodes of the Investment Spotlight series, please visit investmentspotlightshow.com. That's investmentspotlightshow.com. Gentlemen, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. Important information. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice, and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security, and you should consult your attorney or tax advisor. All information has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but its accuracy is not guaranteed. There is no representation or warranty as to the current accuracy, reliability, or completeness of, nor liability for, decisions based on such information, and it should not be relied on as such. Pinger Systems, LLC, doing business as Resilient Advisor, was compensated for the production of this content.